Well, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was in a locker room at my local fitness center, and I overheard the tail end of a conversation just as I walked toward my, where I usually change and get ready to go work out. And it was clearly the tail end of a conversation, uh, but I had not heard what went ahead of time. But here's what I heard. First guy says, well, you have to remember that all religion is evil by definition. That's what he said. All religion is evil by definition. Second guy says, well, I guess it depends how seriously you get into it. Okay, that was all I heard. And it was enough to make me mad. It made me mad, and then it made me think. I didn't say anything because I hadn't heard the rest of the conversation, but it made me think, what would, I, what would I like to ask that first guy who said all religion is evil? I would ask him, I think, how he defined the word religion. For if by the word religion he meant human systems of beliefs, rituals, and laws that through the centuries have been responsible for everything from crusades to jihads to ethnic cleansings, I would have probably tended to agree with them to at least some degree. Yeah, that kind of religion could be said to be evil. But if by religion he meant faith in Jesus Christ or participation in his church, I would have told him he couldn't be any more wrong. And I would say that because Christianity, properly understood, is not a religion. Some of you are going, did he just say what I think he said? Yeah. Christianity, properly understood, is not a religion, but rather a relationship. For Jesus did, never, did not call us to form or join a religion, ever. Read the, read the Bible. He never called us to form a religion. He called us to follow him. It's a relationship. Today we continue our series, Growing Smaller, the Paradox of Spiritual Greatness. And by growing smaller, we're talking about what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to reread this text for you again. We've started each week of this series with it. Listen for the time. I'm going to have you chime in and read it with me. Matthew's writing, he says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, now join me, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many." Now, Jeff and I have been calling this the growing smaller principle. You know, the world thinks to be great, you have to become larger. You have to become more affluent. You have to become more successful. And that makes you great. Jesus said it's exactly the opposite. Greatness comes in serving someone else. Greatness comes in identifying with the one who came to serve us. So far in this series, we've looked at what the growing smaller principle looks like in marriage between husbands and wives. We looked at what it means in families between children and parents, at work between bosses and employees, in neighborhoods, and today we're looking at the whole world. What does growing smaller look like in the world? We're going to jump to a text in Acts chapter 1. It's familiar. You'll recognize it. Looking at it perhaps in a slightly different context. Jesus is speaking. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, in this text, which again, we're, we, we, most of us have known of for many, many years, we see, first of all, that Jesus is clearly teaching us that the gospel is to have global impact. Those are his own words. To the, to the ends of the earth, he says. When I think about global impact, I, I can't help myself, and I've talked about it before, I always think about Coke, Coca-Cola. The story of Coca-Cola is arguably the most successful marketing strategy the civilized world has ever seen. Did you know that today the Coca-Cola company reports sales in every single country in the world except for three? I could have a contest for those three, but Cuba, North Korea, and Myanmar. And my guess is you could find that on the black market in all three of those services, uh, countries. A total of 1.8 billion bottles of Coke products are consumed every day. Every day. There's a marketing company that has estimated that roughly 90% of the world's population recognizes the Coke logo as a brand. 
The same company estimates that 54% of the world's population recognize the cross as the symbol of Christianity. Think about that for a moment. We're talking about basically carbonated sugar water with no demonstrable nutritional value. In fact, most doctors will say it's bad for you. You know, it can corrode and eat up pennies, you know. Yet we consume it at a rate that Coca-Cola has had 50 consecutive years of increased sales. Jesus envisioned a day, he says in Acts chapter 1, when the gospel would actually reach more people than Coca-Cola. We see this in many places in Scripture. In John 3.16, he says, For God so loved not the North American world, not all the people who look like us and talk like us and dress like us, but God so loved the world. That means pretty much the whole thing. Everyone. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, You, my followers, go into all the world and preach the gospel. As the church of Jesus Christ, we have a mandate to spread the good news to the whole world. Secondly, Jesus also here is teaching us that the gospel's global impact is to take place through us. He says, You will be my witnesses, not those of you who have gone to seminary. Those of you who have committed yourself to become missionaries, you, all of you, you who call yourself by name, you will be my witnesses. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The key word there is pretty obvious. You. In other words, Jesus' entire marketing strategy is us. That's it. There's no plan B. It's us. The question is, how? And throughout history, there have been several models for this global impact. In the Middle Ages, it was the crusade, basically evangelism at the end of a sword. From the 11th to the 13th centuries, thousands of thousands dead in the name of Christ. We think we'd probably pretty much agree that's not a highly effective method, somewhat counterproductive to the gospel when, God said, when Jesus said, God so loved the world So we don't do crusades anymore. For much of the 18th to 19th centuries, the model was colonialism. That is moving into the area of the world with the gospel, but taking our entire Western culture with us so that what's left is something that looks pretty much like North America and the gospel gets lost in all of that. I think we would agree that's not the best model either. Here's a good question. How did Jesus think we should do it? What did he have to say about that? I'm going to read you a parable now. You'll recognize the parable. It's one of Jesus' more well-known parables. It's also one of his more harder-hitting parables. Let me read it for you. Watch the screens. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, Jesus said, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now this is a parable, and a parable is simply a a story with a main spiritual point. Now it's very important here to understand that this is not a a salvation parable. Jesus is not telling us that our, our eternal destiny, our salvation is based on how many good deeds we do for the less fortunate. That's not what he's saying. He say, is saying that these kinds of things are just what pe- people who follow him 
tend to do because this is what Jesus wants us to do. You get the difference? We don't do these things because we're trying to earn God's favor. We do these things because we have already received God's favor by his grace and Jesus calls us to follow him. Jesus is teaching us that following him is, first of all, learning to see. Learning to see. During my last semester of seminary, way back in 1985, I took a class in evangelism. And the, the final project of the class was a field trip into Chicago during which we were required to engage in a spiritual conversation with a total stranger. I was terrified. Talk about out of comfort zone, way out of my comfort zone. It's one thing to talk about spiritual things with someone you kind of know, but it's a whole other thing to talk to a total stranger. I had no idea how to do this. So they took us down to the city, dropped us off, told us they had three hours to have this conversation uh, where we talked to, uh, to some, some stranger about the gospel, and we had to come back, and we had to share it, and that was our final grade uh, for the class. Took us down to the city, dropped us off someone, I don't remember where we were, dropped us off on a, on a st uh, street corner, and said, we'll pick you up right here in three hours. So I started walking down the street of Chicago trying to avoid people. You know, walking just, how you doing? How you doing? You know, I had no idea what to do. I'm kind of praying, I'm, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. And at some point, I don't know how long it was into my walk, I, I noticed sort of out of my peripheral attention, there was a gentleman standing up with his back up against the wall um, asking for money. He's kind of shaking a cup. And you've seen, the situ you've seen that setting in the city many times, I'm sure. He was just looking for money, panhandling. And as I walked by, he was just saying things, not really loud, but just, just saying, can, it, can you help me out? Can you spare a buck? Can you spare some change? Can you help a guy out? Like that. And so I stopped. I had to look funny standing in the uh, sidewalk. Just, I stopped. Usually I would, I would keep walking. You just don't make eye contact, so you don't have to think about it. You know, you keep walking because you don't really know what to do. Should I give money? Should I not give money? So you, I, but I stopped. And something in my head said, that's the guy. That's the guy you should have a conversation with. I'm like, what? That guy? Goes, yep, that's the guy. Now I know that was the Holy Spirit. At the time, it just seemed kind of crazy. So I walked up to the guy, and as I walked up to him, I had no idea what to say, but I noticed there was a burger king across the street. So I said, uh, hey, you, uh, are you hungry? Could I buy you a burger? I mean, I'm going to go over that burger king right there. You want to join me? And he looked at me for just a moment, and he said, burger sounds good. Okay. And, and we walked together, him and his cup, and we, we walked across the street into the Burger King, ordered a couple of burgers, a couple of drinks, and we started to talk. It wasn't until we sat down, I found out his name was John. I told him my name. He was a gentle-looking, rather dignified-looking man, African-American, 55. He was maybe 30 years older than me, 55 or 60 years old. And we just started to eat our burgers and talk. And he told me a little bit of the story of his life, a story of brokenness and sadness, family that was gone, addiction, how he wound up on the street. And he was honest and, and articulate in a way that just surprised me. And then he asked me about my life. And I told him, I'm a seminary student trying to figure out what God wants me to do with my life. And we just talked back and forth about, about 30 minutes. When we finished our burgers, finished our drinks, it was time to go. I needed to get back. And we talked a little bit about the gospel. And he grew up in the church. He knew the gospel. He'd been away from it for a long time and all that. But we went to leave. Standing out in front of the Burger King, uh, I went to say goodbye. And he shook my hand. But as he shook my hand, he looked right at me and he said, he said, thanks for the burger, but i got to be honest with you. He said, he said I'm a wino. And I could, that was his word. I'm a wino, and I could really use a drink, he said. I didn't know what to do, but I reached in my pocket, and I still had five bucks left. I took out a $5 bill, and I gave it to him. I said, John, I hope you won't use this to buy a drink. I hope you use it to get a meal tonight. I hope you'll find your way back to the church, back to the God who loves you more than you love yourself. I just gave it to him, shook his hand. He looked me right in the eye. He took the money, and he said, son, you're going to be a heck of a priest. Only he used a different word than heck of a, a little more colorful. I never forgot that conversation. Jesus said, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Jesus, I think, is saying that the gospel teaches us to see in a different way. The gospel teaches us to see people as Jesus sees them. Not a nameless, homeless man on the side of the road looking for a handout. Not an interruption to our busy lives, but rather a man with a name 
and a life story. A man worthy of conversation more than pity. A man that God could actually use to teach and encourage me as much as I could him. He was one of the first people, other than my parents, to recognize God's call of ministry in my life. Astonishing to me. Jesus describes the least of these, the poor, the sick, the prisoner, the foreigner, as his own brothers and sisters. And then he goes even further to say, in effect, and because they are my brothers and sisters, whatever you do for them, you do for me. See, the gospel teaches us to see like Jesus sees, to see people like he sees people, to see the world like he sees the world. Secondly, Jesus teaches that following him is learning to care. It's learning to see, first of all, then it's learning to care. In 1985, right about that same time, right before I came to FBCG, um, I had, my wife and I had a chance to go to Bolivia and South America as short-term missionaries. We just taught a small class in conversational English at a small evangelical university, and uh, during our time there, we traveled to a city called La Paz. La Paz is one of the highest cities in the whole world, something, something like 12,000 feet above sea level, beautiful city, and we were visiting some missionary friends. We went out to dinner one night, and coming back home at night, they eat dinner late in Latin America, so we're coming back home 10, 10, 30 at night. It's dark. It's very cold because the altitude is, is, is quite severe, so it's cold and dark. We're walking home. We're about a block or two away from the apartment where they lived, and crossing a street, as I came to it, we, all four of us were walking, we, we just finished crossing a street, and I heard a sound. I think I was the only one who heard it. And it was a very soft, muffled sound, and I kind of had to look down into the darkness. I couldn't see very clearly, and then I found the source of it. Now we're still walking. It happened in a split second. As we're, and I saw this little boy, six, seven, eight years old, sitting on the sidewalk with his back against the wall, and he was just crying softly into the night by himself, 10.30 at night on the streets of La Paz, Bolivia. And I can't, I, I, you could imagine what was flashing in my mind even as we're walking, because I don't think we ever really even slowed down, because I think I'm the only one that heard it. I'm looking at him thinking, in my mind, who, why is he here? Is he hungry? Is he cold? Where are his parents? Where does he live? Who leaves a little boy in the street at night? How would I talk to him? I don't really have the language. What does he need? What would help him? Is he sick? All that went through my mind as I walked and because all that was going through my mind, I didn't do anything. We just walked back to their apartment. And all these years since then, every time I read this parable, I think of that little boy. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. See, in this part of the parable, I think Jesus is teaching us first to see and then to care. What does it mean to care? Well, first of all, it means to feel something. The word compassion in the New Testament means to feel something in the gut. It means to have an emotional reaction to something. And then it means to do something. Now, caring can mean just offering material help at time of crisis. It means wanting to help. A neighbor's house burns down. We offer them to our house to come live so they can survive. Hurricane devastates an island village. We give money so people can have food and water and survive. I still wish I'd given that little boy just my sweater at least that night so he could be warm. It would have been something. And we do plenty of this kind of caring as a church family. Our food pantry serves over 200 families every month. Our benevolent fund just reaches out and helps people through generosity. But caring is also more than giving away surplus food or giving away surplus dollars or boxes of old clothes. Caring means to see people Caring means to learn about their stories. Caring means to go beyond the quick fixes for today's immediate needs to helping people rebuild their lives with dignity and hope. And this kind of caring is much more difficult, requires much more time and energy invested. In the case of that little boy so long ago, it would have been taking time to stop and ask some questions, find someone who could translate and get the language where are your parents? Where do you live? Are you hungry? Are you cold? Are you sick? Then going to find out where he lives. Do his parents have jobs? Do they have enough income? Do they have, any, do they have capacity to care for him? It's a complicated deal, caring. 
It would have taken way more time than I was really, really willing to give at that time. This, by the way, is why La Roca State Skate Church in Ecuador is one of our Serve the World partners this year. You heard about it last weekend. It, this, this is a ministry that cares about some of the least of these, these street boys in Ecuador that their society has cast out, their families have cast them out. And Brock and Nancy love these young men, get to know them, skateboard with them, and they're creating a church that speaks the gospel into these boys' lives. Amazing. Or Emmanuel House, the partner we talked about tonight in Aurora, helping refugee families break the, the deadly cycle of poverty by helping them save enough to buy their own homes. And that produces stability. It correlates to finishing school. It correlates with a reduction in crime. It correlates with all kinds of things. See, caring starts with seeing, and then caring becomes feeling, and then action. Sometimes giving, sometimes serving, sometimes getting to know, sometimes building friendships that produce lasting change. It's hard. And to do that, Jesus says, we must then learn to share. Learn to see, learn to care, and then learn to share. Uh, during my years when I was student ministries pastor here, we went off into the Dominican Republic. We had a relationship with some people down there that were building uh, small orphanages for children. Every time we'd go down, we would spend about half our time working on the buildings, you know, laying blocks and that sort of thing, digging holes, and about half the time with the kids that just came from these impoverished communities to, to be blessed by these orphanages. And one of the things I noticed early on on those trips was one of the first things the little kids will ask you when you get to their village is a Spanish question. They'll say, ¿Cuándo se van? ¿Cuándo se van? And I'm not fluent in Spanish, but I learned pretty quickly what that meant. Literally, it means, when are you going? Or when do you have to leave? And it seemed odd at first. We just got here. Why are they asking us when we have to leave? Well, then I figured it out over the years. When it's kind of cultural, but what they're saying is, how long can you be with us? How long are you going to say? It's just their reverse way of saying it. Cuando se van? How long can you be in our community? How long can you be with us? How long can we have you to get to know you? Because what really mattered to those kids was not the building we were building. It wasn't the support we were bringing. It wasn't the money we were bringing into their community. It was our friendship. It was time spent together. It was laughter and playing and holding their hands and just getting to know them and caring about them. That's why they ask us on the first day, cuando se van? I think we can see the importance of caring through relationships through Jesus' words if we listen carefully enough. He says, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. That's physical needs, offering physical help for physical needs, food and water. Then I was a stranger and you invited me in. Ooh, that's a different deal. I needed clothes and you clothed me. Okay, clothes, we can take a box of clothes. I was sick and you looked after me. There it is again. That's a different deal altogether. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Much greater investment to go and visit, to look after rather than drop off a box of clothes. Notice, Jesus is teaching to be willing to share not just our material resources or our financial resources, but to share our time, our love, our friendship our hearts. That's why we as a church make a priority of choosing serve the world partners or short-term mission partners with whom we can establish long-term relationships. La Roca Skate Park Church in Ecuador is the result of 20 years of relationship building in those communities to build trust. Uh, Turkey, we've been there over a decade hoping the same thing happens there. Nigeria, Art and Dorothy go from our church and build this HIV uh, AIDS ministry in that part of Nigeria. Emmanuel House in Aurora or Ukraine, Stephen's House in Ukraine, where uh, Elise West, whose family goes to our church, is trying to build a long-term caring ministry to men with special needs in that part of the world. Jesus says we must learn to see the least of these. Then we learn to care for the least of these, and then we learn to share with the least of these. Not to create dependence on our resources, but rather to bring blessing and hope that come with sharing what it means to experience God's kingdom purposes in the communities in which these people live and the communities in which we are able to serve. I want to wrap up by beginning with a, a C.S. Lewis quote. He once wrote, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. There's no neutral ground in the universe. 
Powerful thought. I believe we can boil down Jesus' whole parable to this. He wants us to reach the world by serving the world. That's the method. We are the means. That's the method. Reach the world by serving the world. Back to the guy in the fitness center. All religion is by definition evil. This is why serve the world for our church family is so important. That guy is the reason why serve the world is so important. See, a lot of people have issues with religion. I get it. A lot of people have issues with the church, capital C. I get it. A lot of people have issues with Christians. I get it. But nobody has an issue with serving the least of these. Nobody. I would say to that guy next time, hey, come check out the people I know. Come watch them and you'll know who Jesus is. We have a method. Jesus said, serve as I have served you. We are to make the gospel visible through extraordinary generosity and service. And the questions are, do we see, do we care, and do we share? Let's bow in prayer as we close today. Lord God, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your mandate. You've chosen us and called us to this incredible opportunity and responsibility. You're teaching us to see. You're teaching us to care. and You're teaching us to share. To serve the world in your name. Because through our service, the world will see who you are. Help us to do so in your name. Amen.